Well, we are in a situation where liquidity is, why secondary is because uh, it's, liquidity is very hard to come by. People do not have liquidity from, nothing is being sold or fewer deals are being done as, as Michelle was talking about it. So they can't exit the deals. So LPs are looking for liquidities and, and, and GPs are looking for liquidity and secondary is a way to create them. Uh, do you have a sense of, com compared to historical years, are they selling their better deals because they want to get the deal done? Or are they selling their dogs because everybody says it's a great time to be in secondary and they've raised a lot of money? Mm. Uh, so so um, I'll go and you guys should all go because I think everybody's going to have a perspective on this. And I'm going to get a little bit wonkish, so forgive me for this. Um, we track it and the short answer to the question is yes, people have to sell good funds to maintain good pricing. And in and, and the way that we think about this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a little bit wonkish, like I said. So in a normal year, pre 2020, you would get 95 cents to par. So if a zero to 5% discount relative to your last valuation on a private equity fund, LP interest to sell it, you would typically be selling your non core funds for the in, in a normal market environment, what you're doing is you're either selling because you've got a distressed need, um, those were fewer and further between for 15, the last 15 years, uh, or you're selling because you're doing sort of portfolio rebalancing and or management, you've got non-core names. And the, the trend in this industry in a few words is fewer but larger, right? We're gonna commit to fewer managers, but write larger checks into them. We're gonna do uh, bigger bets with our highest conviction GPs. And what that means is that, uh, and I'll use a metaphor because we're in a place called this, uh, you'll get left on the cutting room floor, right? And so you've got managers that are, non-core managers that you don't intend to continue with. And if you can get a zero to 5% discount for them, you're going to sell them, right? So dogs on fair, but you're probably selling your BB pluses for 95 cents on the dollar. Um, and we've got this internal qualitative measure at Stepstone that we call top pick potential outperformer performer. We segment the entire private markets, every fund that's coming to market in the next two years with those rankings. Um, and the way it works out is top 10% ish ends up with stop pick the next 20, 25% ends up with potential high performer, everybody else sits in performer. Um, and in a normal market environment, so that 95 to par environment, what we saw is 15-ish percent of the LP transaction volume was top picks and potential performers. And so, you know, 85% of it was you selling what we would define as not super high conviction names. Uh, fast forward to right now, prevailing market prices have come back a little bit. We were talking about this this morning. I would say still off of peaks by, it depends on the fund, but um, let's say anywhere from 500 to 1,000 basis points. If you do that quality adjusted like for like, uh, and this is where the see that's both wonkish and fanciful because there's no such thing as quality adjusted like for like, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Um, if you look at the proportion of funds coming now, it's sort of 30 to 40% top picks and personal sharp performers for us. And so the quality is very far up. If you look at closed deal volume, so what happens in the secondary market right now is we'll close $100 billion of volume this year. We'll have $200 billion in actionable deal volume. So if you look at closed deal volume, not just what comes to market, 50 to 60% of those are potential outperformers and top picks for us. Um, and those funds were not the funds trading at 95 to par five years ago. Those funds were trading at par plus. They were trading at par to 110. And so, you know, if the market today is, let's call it 88 cents among friends, it's 88 cents for those very high conviction funds that exist right now that used to be par plus funds. And so we're probably 10 to 15 points off of peaks. What happens now is those B pluses sell in the low 80s and the Bs, they don't sell at all, at all. There is no active secondary market for those B non-core funds right now because there's no price that makes sense for sellers. Um, at least that, that's been that's been our view. I'm curious what you guys have seen too. That's good, good to get a perspective on a, another way that investors stratify the, the funds universe. Uh, to your question on quality, um, you know, maybe taking this, this question from the GP secondary perspective, which Matt provided a great overview of a few minutes ago. Um, what that involves is, is, a, is a general partner that has maybe 16 total portfolio companies spread between three funds, and, and they, can, they can continue to, to, to hold, or they can choose to sell those portfolio codes every day. And for a subset of the portfolio, they'll choose to sell it. And for, for the reasons that have been touched on at surface level in this conversation this afternoon, it's a tough time to sell portfolio companies and control exits. And what we've seen and what we focus on, and I think Matt would, would agree from his perspective on the GP-led secondary market is general partners are saying, okay, I can't sell that company, 
but I have this big audience of limited partners that wants liquidity and may need liquidity to fund their, their private equity program, which is now strained because there haven't been distributions in a significant way for two years. And so as the general partner says, well, I have to supply some liquidity to my LPs to keep them happy. What is a method that I can do that with that doesn't involve me selling any of these choice 16 assets at prices that I would deem to be temporarily unattractive? Meaning, if I wait only a year, I think I can get not 200 million, but 275 million for that portfolio co. And so what we're seeing is general partners are looking at that audience of 16 companies and saying, okay, I'm going to choose my crown jewel asset that I find to be the type of business that I would like to own forever if I can, or if I could, but I cannot because it's in a Roman numeral fund that has a defined end date that has these pesky investors that want capital back. And, and so, you know, what we focus on are trying to find the, the best sponsors that own these niche companies that they would like to own forever if they, they, they could, but they can't. And so we provide them a mechanism to buy it out from the fund. At a, at a price that we find, you know, fair and acceptable to us, but defensible if it ends up on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, we, we have done some tracking of this, which I'll, I'll give you this anecdote, which is that if you look at the dollar amount that the general partner put in the fund, so, so day one, the fund is 100, I'll use very base, basic math here to make it easy. But if, if on day one, it's a $100 million fund seven years ago. The GP commits $2 million or 2%. Some more. Let's just use that number. And then they, then they take that crown jewel asset four years later, five years later, and say, we want to do this thing called a continuation vehicle with you people on the panel and your funds, your secondary capital will support that. What we've done is we've tracked the dollar commitment that those general partners have in the individual deal. And in the transactions we focus on, it tends to be about four to one. So, so the GP committed $2 million to a fund five years ago. Okay, that's a meaningful number. $2 million is a lot of money. Well, then today, they're doing a continuation vehicle on this crown jewel asset, and they're putting $8 million of their own money, capital at risk, that if the transaction underperforms, they're going to they're gonna share in that pain in a disproportionate way because they could have taken that $8 million and sold the company. Maybe they wouldn't get that $8 million in total because it's a dislocated credit market today, but it's a lot of money. And the transactions that we're focusing on, Seema, to your point, yeah. are those deals where the sponsor wants to, to roll 100%, where the management wants to roll 100%. We did a transaction in 2022 where the CEO founder of the company chose to roll a eight-figure number into the company at the new price because in that case, this CEO said, there's no better way for me to, to position my own capital than in my company that I control. And even though it's at a 2.5 or 2.75x what the old, old money price was, he'll put that money back in at, at today's price. So we're focused on quality. There are you know troubled asset deals that get done we don't focus on that. We don't like the alignment. And, you know, stylistically, we have a very focused approach to what we do. Um, and so we're focused on quality. We've seen, I, I think, the, the barometer for quality in the GP-led secondary market has, I, I would say, almost universally moved up in terms of, in terms of quality. I, was gonna say, I think the GP-led market, the quality thing is so much more acute than it is on the LP side. The, the GP-led market is I'm going to do the tagline. It's truly best sponsors, best assets, best alignment. I mean, we're seeing weighted average 10 to 12% GP commits on these things versus 2% in a fund. Um, and when I said there's no market for B funds on the LP side, there's barely a market for A minus assets on the GP led side. And so the quality is much higher. And I, in part, that is because our job on this stage for 20 years has been secondaries as a risk averse equity investment class. And so if we're going to do this, and we're going to take that isolated risk and we're going to not buy in at a discount. We're going to take incremental duration. They need to be the best. I mean, it's the same thing that you guys have been doing now for 20 years at this point. And we're sort of catching up on the GP-led CV side. But um, that that scheme is is that quality quotient is that much higher on that side of the market. Yeah, just maybe to comment on the LP side. So 
we've seen a lot of LPs come to market with portfolios and funds, and a lot of times they end up not transacting. They don't like the price that they're offered, so they pull back. You know, some deals are getting done, some very large deals. In fact, today it was announced that Ardian purchased a $2.1 billion portfolio from CPP. So some deals are getting done, but in many cases they're not. So then what happens? Oftentimes the seller goes back and maybe changes the mix a bit. So they'd wanted to get rid of their legacy investments. Um, often their legacy for various reasons. It doesn't always mean performance. Could just be manager that has gotten too large. They don't like the alignment anymore. Someone else, you know, another CIO uh, developed those relationships. Many reasons they could be considered legacy. Uh, so that's what they'd like to sell. But in some cases, they have to go back and add a sweetener, if you will, some you know, very attractive funds in order to get the deal done. So they can either add those funds to the mix and go back to market, or often what we're seeing is very structured transactions where they sell a strip. Okay, maybe we'll sell 25, 50% of a manager we really like, you know, a couple of those just to help get rid of the ones that we don't want to uh, be stuck with. So we're seeing a lot of creativity on the structuring end, but also helps minimize the discount from an optical perspective. So LPs have a board they have to answer to, and they're saying, why are we selling, you know, funds at a discount by structuring? They can effectively reduce that, deferring some of the proceeds for often a couple of years. Um, and then just on the GP side, you know, completely agree that the quality of sponsors and assets has markedly improved. You know, continuation funds used to be called bridge funds or the provenance of, of zombie funds. But now it's really the GPs who don't want to part with their best assets. You know, strong GPs, they want to hold on rather than just selling to another sponsor. That being said, I think there are some questions around the alignment, and it really comes down to the details of how these deals are done. You know, are the LPs you know, given offered a status quo option? Can they keep their asset in the fund? Uh, do they have to roll? Are they being asked to roll at a discount? Um, how is that valuation set? You know, now the SEC is requiring a fairness opinion on continuation deals. That wasn't always the case, um, but even then. You know, how is that value set for a private asset? Um, the GP is on both sides of the transaction. They're effectively taking an asset out of a fund, selling it into another vehicle. So if they're resetting their economics, they're motivated to have a low price, right? They can then get a more upside when they sell. So really need to assess these yeah. very carefully. And yeah. there are conflicts along the way. Um, also depends on who's coming into the deal. Are there a lot of fees? Who's paying the fees? A uh, number of other questions. Um, often LPs are given you know, a week or two to evaluate these continuation fund deals that come with 200 pages of documentation. The LP agreement, it's basically re-underwriting an investment um, with very little time. So LPs do not love them, uh, but from a return perspective, if you're investing in continuation deals, they can certainly be attractive.